Welcome. So this uh, is going to be the first in a series of lectures about operating systems. Um, and, and I'm going to jump right into this. Um, so we'll start with some logistics. Uh, the, these videos are in links to them along with the rest of course materials, which will be recommended reading to accompany uh, the lectures, um, a set of homeworks, projects, and then um, uh, some sample exams. Uh, so, so essentially a, a full set of course materials for what uh, I believe will cover um, a, a basic approximation of what an undergraduate operating system course will look like. Uh, will show up uh, on my website, uh, wills.co.tt slash os. Um, and so the design here is to be fairly flexible. I'm going to record lectures in uh, roughly 45 minute chunks uh, covering, covering this material. And it's designed so that it can work uh, essentially either in a, a quarter or a semester uh, style format. In a, if you've got a, a, a semester, um, so you know, 10 to 12 weeks, you, you'd likely be aiming for about four of these a week. And you could imagine that happening either, um, a course might meet twice a week in 90 minute blocks, and you would watch sort of four of them, but two at a time. Um, in, a, in a semester, you might also have like three uh, 45 minute or 50 minute courses uh, where you would go through these and, and then you would end up with maybe closer to 15 weeks of, of material. Um, so it's, it's designed uh, for, for, for sort of a, a, a bit of flexibility and pacing. Um, and then these exams or, or these lectures are going to be logistically just a little bit more separated from the, the other parts of what would traditionally be in a course. And this is uh, also not uncommon. So, so I can maybe help frame this a little bit uh, by talking about that just for a minute at the beginning here. Um, these lectures are going to be focusing on the concept, concepts that you will find when you are uh, thinking about systems and operating systems. And so what that means is, how do you reason about this? What are the constraints? What are the problems? How have people tried to solve these when they're dealing with operating systems? Uh, and, and so the, the main thing that I'm hoping to get across here is intuition and uh, tactics for thinking and solving uh, these sorts of problems. There have been a number of textbooks that have come out on operating systems over the years, and they range quite a bit. Some of them uh, are quite philosophical and will uh, approach the concepts in, in a similar way to these lectures. And so uh, if, you, if you end up uh, working with one of those textbooks, you'll, you'll uh, end up with a very sort of similar set of material to what these lectures cover. And so you can figure out which, uh, which of those basically you learn better from. If you learn better from listening and, and watching me and seeing slides, you can focus on the lectures. And if you learn better from reading, uh, you can focus on a textbook. There's a set of other textbooks that end up being much more about the mechanisms and the specific codes so that get you closer to um, being able to talk about how and how to actually build some of these mechanisms. And so those will end up being closer to what you would get out of projects and homework, um, which is where you're going to dive a little bit deeper. Um, and, and that's the other half. You probably want um, to spend some time thinking about concepts and, and gaining that intuition. And then you want to spend time uh, much deeper actually looking at code, uh, whether that comes from a more uh, hands-on textbook, uh, which I think will, will get you closer, but you're really going to learn the, the code side from actual implementation and projects. So uh, the, the basic plan is when you go to this website, in addition to these lectures and, and materials, uh, I'll, I'll try and give you some page numbers of, of where a range of current popular operating systems books um, cover the same material. Uh, and then I'll also have a couple of the sort of common project frameworks um, that, that get used as the supplement and complement to this sort of course um, to, to help you actually get that hands-on knowledge about uh, how these mechanisms actually get implemented. Cool. Um, there's not much else to say about logistics. Um, Feel free to contact me if you if you have questions about this material. 
Um, I can be reached as willscott at gmail.com uh, for my email, uh, and I, I will do my best to uh, add any additional uh, supplementary material that uh, is not already contained here. I'll give a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I did my PhD at the University of Washington in Seattle. That's the far northwest of the United States. Uh, and I studied in the uh, networking and distributed systems lab there. Uh, and so that's, that was a group of uh, graduate students and professors who were looking at how uh, computer networks get used in data centers and thinking a lot about distributed systems. So how, how do you go from these individual machines uh, and have them work cooperatively uh, in larger groups and, and at an internet scale? Um, after that, I did a, a post, uh, postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, so I was a researcher at the University of Michigan, uh, which is uh, sort of in the middle of the country, the north, north middle. Um, and I studied there more about internet security. So thinking about how uh, the internet as a single system, you know, the, this, this huge global set of computers that are connected, um, how, do we, how do we understand that better? How do we measure it? How do we um, start to gain a, a deeper understanding uh, and, and especially as, as we get to the edges of it? Um, so, so places where um, it, it's sort of a more tenuous connection, how do we uh, maintain access and how do we get people online? Before graduate school, I worked at uh, Google for a year uh, on the Gmail team, thinking about how a, a, a large system at scale in enterprise works. Um, and then after Michigan, I spent a year uh, working at a computer cloud security startup. Um, so in, in Silicon Valley, getting to see what, what that life is like. Uh, and, and that's been um, a great experience, um, just uh, seeing how things sort of move in that, in that sort of environment, because it's, uh, uh, very different from, from a large uh, enterprise like Google. In, in college, I studied abroad in China. Um, and so some of the goal and pacing uh, in this set of lectures is going to be trying to make this accessible to a pretty wide range of people who are interested in learning about operating systems. Uh, I think many courses uh, that I've seen uh, work reasonably well in person. Uh, that's, that's going to be thinking about how uh, to motivate people to some extent, uh, I think that that is important. Um, but but the other part of that is how do we make sure that we are communicating effectively uh, in a way that a, a pretty diverse uh, set of people can understand and, and gain stuff. Uh, personally, uh, when I'm not uh, doing this stuff uh, and sitting at a computer, uh, I enjoy bicycling and and skiing uh, as as outdoor activities. So uh, for that reason, I'm I'm currently in Seattle, which uh, is a great place for, for both of those things. All right, so uh, with that as introduction, um, we'll, we'll start uh, with just a, a basic introduction uh, to this space today. Um, so what is an operating system is sort of the first question that we need to address. So operating systems, when we sort of think about them, you've got a lot of programs, applications running on your computer. Right? So you've got a web browser probably running. Um, you maybe have games. You maybe have a text editor. You maybe have uh, you know, a, a word processor. There's a set of different programs. And each of those programs shouldn't have to figure out how to talk to the various pieces of hardware on your computer by itself. Right? There's a lot of common things that all of these want. Right? They want to display images and, and their layout on the screen. They want to receive input from your keyboard. They want to store files on your disk. And so the operating system ends up being the bridge. It's the middle part that deals with all of that common functionality that every application is going to need. Right? So um, we want to solve the problem of, uh, you know, there are lots of different hardware. You know, I'm running a specific computer. You probably have a different computer. Um, but we can use the same applications because we've abstracted this to uh, an interface that is defined by a common operating system. And so the operating system is this narrow middle that, that takes a lot of different types of hardware and a lot of different programs and allows those programs to run on all the different hardware without having to think about it. So we're saving a lot of effort by doing this. Um, there's also a lot of other things that that operating system is doing in that position. So for instance, uh, more generally, right, it is managing these resources. Uh, for the user and for the applications. So in addition to this 
library. Um, the operating system is doing some permissions things. It's making sure that one bad application can't crash the computer fully. It can maybe fail by itself, but hopefully it can't mess with other things. It's providing sort of a consistent graphics, right? The, the little bar around all of your applications looks the same. And so that experience of you know, your desktop uh, your folders and and the that that's all part of your operating system, right? That's that's part of Linux or part of Windows or part of Mac. Um, so it's providing some visual metaphors and and some structure for how you reason about interacting with your computer that's defined at the operating system. Um, and it's also providing a bunch of resources to make the programs lives easier. So beyond just having this, you know single abstraction that hides specific hardware. You're getting a bunch of uh, sort of helper things to make the program's lives easier, right? The program doesn't have to directly manage pixels, for instance. It might if it wants to do graphics, but it doesn't have to. It can work with a bit higher level abstractions that the operating system is providing. Um, so, so here's an example of the various places that the operating system exists. There's this system library, which is sort of a shim of code that actually loads inside of the application that is part of your operating system. There's this core, this area called kernel mode, which is the, the core of the operating system itself. So that's where it's managing things like the file system and networking and uh, scheduling. So that's, we're going to talk about that later. Uh, memory. And then there's this hardware abstraction layer where it, it deals with all of the different parts of hardware. And so all of this is the operating system. And so if I step back a layer and, and talk about the operating system sort of in broad tr terms, like what is it that we're doing here? There's three high level functions that we're trying to accomplish as we think about the various concepts that make up operating systems. The first is a referee. And what we mean by a referee is that the operating system is calling shots and saying, you know, in, in a bunch of different players or, or applications and programs that are that are competing for resources. The operating system is saying what's fair and is making choices about who gets to win out when competing for scarce resources. So it's, it's saying, you know, the browser has enough memory already. I'm not actually going to give it more or I'm going to take some memory that's being used by this program that hasn't been actually interacted with recently and give it to the browser. So the operating system is refereeing. Uh, it is, it is Maybe another word for this is it is uh, it, it's defining what's fair, uh, and it's enforcing boundaries. It's it, it's uh, limiting uh, what is available to each program. It's also an illusionist, uh, and so what we mean by that is that as an individual program, so if I write a, a program that will run an application, I don't see the other things going on on the computer. What I see is a virtual set of hardware that I have full control over. So I see a memory space for my memory, and it's not cluttered with anything else. And I see my files, and I can just interact with them. And it means I don't have to worry about all of the other things. My program does not have to be coded to say, well, if the browser is running, then I should work this way. And if it's not running, I should work another way. That all gets hidden by the operating system. From the perspective of any individual program, it's the only thing running, and it has full control. So the operating system is giving the illusion of this mm, sort of ideal virtual machine to each program. And that, and that makes the lives, again, of the program developers much easier because there's much less uncertainty to reason about. And finally, the operating system is a glue. And this is uh, probably the way that we think about most of these visual metaphors the desktop, the clipboard that is copying things between programs. These, these pieces of glue that interact between programs and that provide the overall experience of your operating system, that's the glue, that's the, the thing that holds it together. Okay, So I think these three are maybe the, the, the high level intuition of what we're going to be covering and thinking through. Um, I think the, the bulk of the rest of this course will be on the first two. We'll be talking about how do you manage competition between programs? So if, if I have two programs that both want memory, how are we going to actually do that? And then illusion. So how do I take a single hardware resource, 
Uh, right? My computer has one network port. My computer has one stick of RAM. But how do I make that then appear as a virtual stick of memory for each individual program? And so how do I allocate and split up and hide that splitting up of resources? <clears throat> Great. So um, I think the next thing to, to help cement these concepts is that we maybe I'll give you a, set, a little bit of time to think through what we need from the hardware to support this. So what do I mean that by that? Well, you've got a CPU, right? A, a, a core chip that is actually running instructions. And those instructions may be the operating systems code or they may be applications code. And you also have a bunch of other pieces of hardware on your computer. And so while we've set the goal that the operating system is managing these competition, competing programs, one of the things that we need to think about is can it do it alone? So what do we need from the CPU to help us have the mechanisms that we can isolate applications. Uh, by that, we mean if one program keeps running and goes into an infinite loop, how does the operating system or the hardware switch to another program and not have the whole computer freeze? Another question is, you know, if, if I've got a single hard drive or, or, or space for storage, is there something I need from the hardware to help me isolate applications so that one program doesn't just write over another program? Are there, are there things that I need at a hardware level that are going to support those? Because it's not the operating system being able to do it alone. Uh, in, in fact, what we are seeing in, in development, I think especially in the last decade, is that, uh, well, in, in the last decade, what we have is sort of co-development, where we have hardware manufacturers. So, so think of a chip manufacturer like Intel or ARM. They're building new mechanisms in hardware, and then at the same time updating operating systems to take advantage of those mechanisms. So they're, they're looking for things that the operating system is being slow at performing, and then seeing if there's a way to co-design both a new instruction uh, that the hardware exposes that helps the operating system simplify its ability to perform that task, um, or, or to remove the need for the operating system to do that slow operation uh, through through changing how a hard, the hardware operates or what it exposes. I think previously what we saw was you know, designs of hardware architecture that were able to perform a very uh, general set of tasks quickly. Uh, and so we're optimizing for either uh, common benchmarks of we know that programs that we want to make fast need these sorts of instructions so we will make the hardware uh, as fast as possible at performing those um, and worrying a little bit less about the mechanisms for uh, for 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 the interaction that the operating system would would need to switch between these programs um, so so if you have a workload and a model of which instructions uh, are used commonly, you would try and optimize your speed for that benchmark. But uh, that, that tends in those benchmarks to worry a little bit less about this because what those would be is typically one of a couple things. Um, on a server side, you're going to have probably more often only a single program or a small number of well-contained programs, right? So uh, if you have a web server or you have a data processing, uh, you may be more willing to have an individual computer just do that one task and you want that one task to be optimized because if you uh, you're operating at a scale where uh, rather than switching between multiple programs on a single physical machine you'll just have different machines specialized to do different things uh, and and that was true I think for a while uh, we see that uh, happen in scientific computing and high performance computing that, that we would really focus on uh, optimizing a single specialized task um, but with uh, the cloud, um, in the last 10, 15 years, I think we've seen more of a switch towards this general purpose computing and being willing, in order to optimize the hardware resources uh, on an unknown workload, uh, caring a lot more about some of these, excuse me, interaction points. So uh, in order to uh, provide uh, scalable cloud computing um, and, and, and being able to uh, have sort of these elastic uh, 
uh, load demands, where as a unknown application workload uh, grows and shrinks, you would like to scale and provision more and less hardware for it. What that means is each individual computer is going to be changing what tasks it's doing and needs to be able to switch between tasks quite quickly. And so that, uh, I think as much as anything, has necessitated the need to optimize a lot of these tasks that are associated traditionally with an operating systems workload. So we will talk uh, more about these specific mechanisms, uh, specifically uh, in, in the memory uh, lessons. Um, and, and I'll provide some resources for uh, a little bit broader uh, instruction uh, or a broader uh, set of techniques around that set of problems. Uh, because in addition to what uh, we would often have the operating system do there, we also use things like virtual machines, which can happen at a few different levels uh, in order to, to do this sort of thing. Cool. So uh, with that, I'm going to pause for a minute. And I want you to think and maybe write down or uh, try and challenge yourself to actually have an answer to what you would want from the hardware to isolate applications from each other. Cool. Do you have any answers? OK, so I think, you know, just to seed a couple things in your in your mind, especially if you're drawing a blank. One thing that you're going to need to isolate applications is you're going to need a way for the operating system to regain control of execution. So if a program is running, if it crashes or goes into an infinite loop, you need some way for the hardware to allow the operating system to say, actually stop running this program and be able to switch to other programs or, or to be able to kill that program. When isolating applications from each other's files, you need a way to give a limited view of a, of a hardware resource. So whether that's the CPU enforcing that or whether that's the storage device itself enforcing that, you need a way for the operating system to expose to an application. Um, you, know, you can write, but, but your writes are not, if you, if you keep writing, you don't just overwrite things that are already on this disk. So there's an end point. Of, uh, I, uh, and if you use a pointer or, or you try and write somewhere that I haven't said is okay, that should fail. Um, you can intermediate, and so what I mean by that is you can have the program make each request to write to the operating system, which in software checks that that was okay, uh, and then does the actual physical write and not allow the program to make the, uh, the program requests, the, the, the uh, instructions to the CPU because if the, if the program is just running uh, a set of instructions also on the CPU, what happens if it uh, makes the instruction that says, you know, write to position zero on the disk, write to position one on the disk? Um, those are presumably instructions that the operating system is going to need to be able to use, but you would like to restrict some of these from the program so that the program can't do things it's not supposed to. So, so one of the limits you're going to need is you're going to need to be able to restrict specific operations to only the operating system so that a program can't do the same things that the operating system can do. And the other thing you're going to need to do uh, is think about how you're optimizing, how, how you're dealing with speed. And you may want to push things into hardware, again, to uh, improve the speed. So um, things like when we were thinking about files and do I have access to write in this specific part. Um, so we can, we can have that go to the operating system and in software check that it's an allowed request. But we might want there to be an instruction directly in the hardware where the program can ask to do that and the hardware knows that that type of you know, request, the request to write in this specific part of the disk are allowed and directly allow those and deny others without it having to go to a software check in the operating system code. So can we predefine hardware rules to allow these things to happen more efficiently? Cool. Um, so the other thing that we should be thinking about as we, as we go through this course is how do we evaluate operating systems? So what makes a good operating system? If I'm comparing Mac and Windows and Linux, or if I'm thinking about a new feature 
that's being proposed for an operating system. What makes that a good feature? What is it that we're, what is our metric? What, what is it that we uh, are trying to do, right? So um, we've got a bunch of different approaches. What makes an approach good? What are the things that makes an operating system good? So I'm gonna give you another minute to try and think about this because I think this is an important thing to keep in your mind as you're going through these mechanisms and, and as, as we go through this course is what, what is it that we are optimizing for? What, what is the problem we're trying to solve as we build operating systems and how do we know that we've done it well? So <clears throat> I think there's a lot of answers to that question. Um, hopefully, hopefully you've uh, thought of at least some uh, in, in your own mind for what you think makes an operating system good. Um, but some of the things we can think about is, is these same metrics that hardware vendors use. So how efficiently are programs running, right? So if the operating system is imposing a lot of constraints that cause actual execution of useful tasks to be slow, um, that's a problem. So, so there's some level of performance and efficiency that we can attempt to optimize. There, there's a lot of subjective, and so by subjective, what I'm trying to say is um, things that are uh, qualitative rather than quantitative. So we're not going to optimize them by saying, oh, this is 5% faster, but uh, we can do user studies and have users try and use the operating system to accomplish tasks and see if it is intuitive and see if they are able to regularly, uh, or a lot of users, most users can accomplish those tasks effectively. Um, so we can try and talk about, you know, does this make sense? Is it, you know, are, are especially is the glue uh, that helps connect tasks uh, something that makes sense to people? Um, we can also evaluate uh, an operating system on you know, does it work on most computers? So how much hardware does it support? Uh, how many programs does it support? Um, so, so in addition to uh, that, you know, what workloads is it, is it able to, to support effectively? Um, so, so there's a breadth question um, for, uh, especially for desktop and, and operating systems that are targeting end users that we might care about, right? So, so we see a wide range of breadth, um, you know, from iOS, from Apple, so this is the operating system that runs on an iPhone, it targets a very small number of specific hardware devices uh, that are made by Apple. Uh, and in comparison, you have Android, the competing operating system that uh, Google has pioneered, that runs on a wide variety of devices, uh, in particular because they have made that operating system, which uh, came out of Linux open source. You have a lot of hardware vendors that are able to take the base Android open source project, uh, write the additional device drivers to make it work on their specific phone hardware, and then provide a version of Android uh, for their hardware. And so you end up with Android running on a very wide range uh, of, of phones uh, and tablets uh, compared to, to Apple. And so um, you know, if we want to evaluate the operating system in terms of uh, you know, applicability and breadth, uh, the, the choice of making it open source um, has meant that, that Android uh, runs on a lot more hardware. And maybe that's a goal. Another point that we can evaluate operating systems on is security. So if, if I care about you know, protecting my data, I don't want someone to hack into my computer. You know, that is uh, a, a metric that, that I would care about, right? I would want to use a secure operating system that is effective at limiting programs access um, and that is effective at not uh, having bugs uh, that could cause someone to be able to steal my data or, or corrupt my programs. So, and, 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 you know, these are not the only correct answers. There's many more. Um, but, but I think thinking about, you know, we, we are going to care about different things as we consider different metrics. Um, but, but overall, um, we need to be thinking and weighing these different things uh, in terms of, you know, which uh, end uh, evaluation metrics is it that users are going to care about uh, because that's how they're going to choose an operating system and, and choose which mechanisms uh, are most important. Cool. So um, just to the, the rest of this lecture, uh, this first lecture, 
uh, I'm going to spend sort of the, the, the piece talking about a bit of history uh, and, and where, we, where we are now. Um, we'll start by just briefly going through sort of three major lines of operating systems. So um, the first one is Linux. Linux is a relatively young operating system. Uh, it started, uh, the, the first Linux kernel came out in, at the beginning of the 1990s um, by Linus Torvalds. Um, it's probably one of the most popular server and mobile operating systems today. Um, and, and that, it, it, Linux or, or the Linux kernel, so this, this core operating system part of Linux is used in many, many places. Uh, and, and we'll see that pop up. Um, and, and what we get from Linux uh, and the way that we're going to approach that, uh, a lot of it is this thing called POSIX. And POSIX is a standard that Unix uh, which came before Linux. So Linux comes out of this long Unix uh, historic tradition. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Defines an interface called POSIX, which is sort of the standard set of API calls that a program will use to interact with the operating system and, and therefore to the hardware. So, so Linus uh, developed this first version of Linux as a course project. Um, in, in his operating systems class. Uh, he was uh, learning uh, a, a Unix-like operating systems uh, course um, and, and was taught on something called Minix, which is a minimal Unix uh, operating system, which is a teaching operating system. And, and in that course, they, the students were challenged to develop their own basic operating system kernel for some of the, uh, some of, some of the tasks that you would expect an operating system to perform. Uh, and Linus continued developing his into a full kernel called Linux. So Linux, uh, maybe the the most comp most uh, immediate comparison would be Windows. So Windows had emerged maybe a decade earlier, um, sort of the first Windows as opposed to uh, DOS, DOS, which came before it, uh, happened in the early '80s, uh, and. From the early 90s, you ended up with Windows NT, which was a kernel and you know, a comparable application programming interface uh, to what the Linux POSIX interface had. And that also remained really largely stable. And in fact, the kernel of Windows you know, didn't get a full rewrite uh, until we got into the Windows 8, Windows 10 era um, much more recently, like in, in 2012. So, um, what that means is there was a long period um, where, where both of both uh, the Windows operating system and the Linux operating system really um, had had very relatively stable uh, application programming interfaces and got a lot of programs written against those interfaces. Um, the third operating system that's worth mentioning that we will uh, you know certainly uh, use for examples and and I'm, I think. You probably know, and so we, we shouldn't not mention it. Is is the the Mac operating system? Uh, the Mac operating system actually has two really distinct parts. Um, up until about two thousand, uh, from Mac OS, Mac OS six, seven, eight, nine, this was a custom operating system that um, was really works differently from many of the other operating systems that we'll uh, be able to use for examples. Um, and so. Um, it was much more uh, cooperative. It expected a little bit more from programs compared to many others, um, and, and had a very different, uh, and in some ways more closed environment uh, than many of the others. And then starting from Mac OS X, or Mac OS X as it's written, um, which happened about 10 years ago, um, they, they took, instead of uh, you know, continuing to build from the existing Mac OS 9, um, Apple had recently acquired Next. Well, they, they acquired Next actually uh, a fair amount earlier than that. But um, Next was an operating systems computer company that uh, had developed its own Next Step OS, which was itself a derivative of BSD. BSD stands for the Berkeley Systems Distribution uh, and comes from Berkeley, California, uh, and was a Unix distribution. And so from, from, the, from Unix, uh, one of the Unix uh, sort of early implementations is BSD, and then Next evolved BSD, and then Mac OS X is an evolution of that. And so it, it's coming out of a Unix tradition. Parts of it look very similar to Linux, uh, and some of the internals are somewhat different uh, in terms of how they actually implement that. But it also will have a 
uh, POSIX interface. Uh, and so most POSIX programs you can run uh, also in MacOS 10. You can compile them against that. Here's a broader genealogy, sort of trying to trace some of the influences. So you see on the far side, you've got sort of the Windows ecosystem of MS-DOS um, becoming that early Windows kernel. And then you see the newer Windows in the 90s taking a bunch of ideas out of BSD um, and, and uh, using that as they continue into Windows 8 and Windows 10. Um, and then on the other side of this, you have Multix as the early multi-user uh, operating system that was getting used on a bunch of uh, supercomputers, turning into Unix. And the early uh, breakthrough in Unix is really thinking about how do we treat more things as files. Um, so, so despite you know each device, each piece of hardware, you know being a custom interface that we need to think about. Can we have uh, one more level of abstraction and think about most things in terms of I'm going to write a series, a sequence of data to them, and I can read a sequence of data back, and then we can expose all of these different uh, heterogeneous. So, so uh, instead of having to interface with each one individually, we can think about many of them as a stream of bytes. Um, and so from there we get Linux, um, and we also then get Mock, which turns into Next, which turns into Mac. Cool. The, <clears throat> the final thing to keep in mind as we go through these is thinking a little bit about the constraints that are changing. Because an operating system is not uh, existing in a static environment, uh, but rather uh, the world is changing around us. Uh, and, and some of that happens in terms of the hardware, right? Hardware in your computer now is faster than your computer was a decade ago. Uh, and so if you look at the state of the world, in the early 80s when you know Linux and Mac and Windows uh, were, were first you know getting built uh, they're very different uh, from from where we are now so here's three points this is uh, early 80s 90s and then 2010 or 2011 um, and and if if we look now in 2019 2020 these have many of them have changed yet again so the first thing we can look at is the speed of your CPU. So this is millions of instructions per second. How many, how fast is your is the CPU that things are running on? In the early 80s, most of the operating systems, so Windows was being programmed against a one megahertz processor. So it would do about one million instructions per second. Today, most CPUs on a desktop are going to be four gigahertz, four billion operations per second, right? Um, so this, this is one gigahertz in 2011, but we're already 10,000 times faster and probably maybe 50,000 times faster now. The other thing we can think about uh, that's maybe even more extreme is the cost of those processors. So you know, if I look at how many instructions I can do per dollar, so how much am I paying per speed, that has changed you know, 200,000 times, right? The, not only has the processor gotten faster, but the cost of the processor has gotten cheaper. And so that means that things that were very expensive and that I needed to care about each instruction, maybe I care less about. Maybe I'm willing to spend a few more instructions because they're so much cheaper to do something the right way rather than the fastest way, or in a way that's more understandable and maintainable. The next thing to think about is memory. So DRAM is, you know, my RAM is my random access memory. I can access each part of it. Um, and on an early computer, you might have 10 megabytes of RAM. Whereas, you know, today, um, you know, it's easy to get 16 or 32 gigabytes of RAM on a computer, uh, on a laptop, and, and more on a desktop. And so what that means is my strategies for where I keep the data that a program might need probably change. When I have a very small relative amount of space, I'm going to need to make sure that I can push a lot of the data back outside of my working set, but to a disk something further away. Whereas today, I can expect to keep a lot more stuff in RAM. And so that maybe changes how I allocate my resources. 
our disks have also gotten much bigger. Early disks were quite small, you know, 10 megabytes was not uncommon for what your, your hard drive disk was back in the early 1980s, so only 30 years ago. And now it's easy to get five terabyte, 10 terabyte disks. Right, so this is again a factor of 100,000 and this changes, you know, do I need to keep my program on a CD-ROM? Do I keep the program on my disk? Do I care about compressing stuff versus being able to access it a little bit faster? Our connectivity between computers has also changed. In the early days of the internet, uh, the latency was quite high and the speed, the amount of data that, and throughput for, for how many bytes you could get to another computer a second um, in, in a remote location was very slow. You would expect to get maybe 10 kilobytes, so 10,000 bytes of data uh, in a second. And so that you know is maybe enough for text or simple commands, but it's tough to transfer the actual data, uh, excuse me, it's tough to transfer the actual data uh, in a short amount of time. And so you would have different strategies. For instance, you would try and uh, use Maybe you would physically send a disk with your data to another place and you would just synchronize things. And today, many home users would have five megabytes per second. That's not an uncommon assumption. Um, and, and we are increasingly, you know, some countries are uh, trying to roll out gigabit uh, links so that uh, individual end devices will be connected at gigabit speeds. If you're in a data center, so a, a server at Google, or even a server uh, that you run yourself but in a data center, you can get 10 gigabit or even 100 gigabit connectivity so that you can get you know, uh, these speeds that, that we might see on a LAN to a local set of computers, uh, you, you can get that much bandwidth out to the internet. Likely um, an individual connection, even between two machines in remote data centers, uh, probably you're coding with an expectation today of maybe a gigabit between two servers at most. And then the LAN, the local area network, so I've got a few computers connected in one building, and so I manage this. Um, in, in the 80s, you could expect maybe three megabytes or three megabits per second. And now you would easily expect 10 gigabits. Uh, in a data center, you would, uh, you'll often see computers connected at 40 or 100 gigabits. Uh, depending on what sort of workload they're being optimized for. The <clears throat> maybe most important change, though, I think is this last one, which is thinking about how many users you expect to interact with um, a computer. So in the 80s, when you had supercomputers, um, a institution, uh, so a, a university or a, a company, would have one supercomputer. And it would have many, you know, hundreds of users. And so that one computer was taking um, requests from many users. And we need to figure out how to divide its time, not among programs as much, but, as, but divide time between the different users who wanted to use that scarce resource. And then we have the personal computer revolution in the 90s, where now desktop computers became cheap enough that many people, many individuals got their own computer. And so you now have a really different design where uh, you know Windows and Linux suddenly are trying to cater to computers that have a single user. And then the, the next revolution that, that I think uh, we're still coming to terms with is that uh, as an individual, I no longer necessarily have one computer, uh, but I have a lot of different devices, certainly. Um, right? I have a phone, I have a computer, uh, and then I have uh, tasks or resources that happen in the cloud. And so there's several devices uh, and, and there are becoming more and more ubiquitous devices around me. And the way that I code a operating system uh, where it is instead of saying, I am shifting resources between a lot of users to instead I am running part of the tasks for one user, uh, seems like it might be a very different design. And so that, that is a struggle we are uh, you know, continuing to see. Cool. So it, it's been uh, about 45 minutes. So that this is the I'm, where I'm going to stop for this first lecture. Uh, so I, I hope you will uh, watch the next uh, one as well.
where we will uh, continue and finish the service introduction and overview of operating systems.